among thousands Yeah. 
We should never take Jesus out of church. It's the essence of what we do, it's the essence of our worship. It's the reason why we come every morning. It's the reason for life. He gives meaning to life. His eternal life is everything to us. Center of my life, it's you that I see, it's you that I see, at the center of my song, at the center of it all, it's you that I see, it's you that I at the center of my praise. At the center of my praise, at the center, you're the center of it all. With you, with you, with you, with you, with you, with you, with you. You are the center. You are the center. You are the core. You are my pillar. You are my anchor. You are my pillar. I rest in you. I trust in you. I rest in you. At the center of it all, it's you that I see. It's you that I see. There is power. There is power. There is power in your spirit.
in the love of Christ and just enjoy his goodness and just enjoy your fellowship with the Father, the Holy Spirit, the love of God. Just enjoy knowing Jesus, experiencing his love, experiencing his peace. How you set me free. This morning we worship. We worship. We worship. What you mean to me What you brought me through What you brought me through Have you have you kept me through the storm They don't know How you helped me through They don't know They don't know I almost gave up but you helped me They don't know the assurance of eternal life. What you mean to me. Father, we give you the praise. We just thank you for this amazing time of worship. We are so excited. The Bible says, Philippians 3, put it up, verse 1, TPT. Never limit your joy to the experiences of life. You have something that is greater than any experience of what nature can bring to you. We have the fellowship with the Father. When the Bible, we are saying the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit. We have it all the time. Shout glory! Glory to the Lamb of God. You may take your seat, please. Amen. Amen. Are we blessed this morning? It's always good to just have this great time where we just worship and enjoy the wonderful experience of knowing Jesus. My beloved ones, don't ever limit your joy or fail to rejoice in the wonderful experience of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what church is. That's what your Christianity is about. You have Jesus, you have life. Amen. I don't mind repeating what I've already written you because it protects you. Next verse. This protects you from worries, anxieties, the various things that come in life to pull you on different sides. It says, we have those religious hypocrites who teach you that you should be circumcised to please God. They never show you how God is pleased with you. Religion has beaten you, life has beaten you. But the Bible says, for we have all experienced heart circumcision. And we worship God in the power and freedom of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's what we just did now. Not in laws and religious duties. We are those who boast in what Jesus Christ has done. Not our circumcision. We boast in what Jesus Christ has done. We said that Christianity is not about boasting about our love for God, but boasting about his love for us. 
Christianity is not about our vows and promises to God, but is unwavering promises and steadfastness to us. We boast in what Jesus Christ has done and not what we can accomplish in our own strength. How many people are happy to just know that Jesus Christ has done everything and it is finished? If you are, shout glory. glory. Amen. Amen. Now we are on a very important topic, money and giving, the biblical perspective. How many people are learning something? All right, I think it's only people at the front, the others are not learning. How many people are learning something? Okay, <laughs> praise God. Um, let's go into some of the things that we have shared, but I'll just take it a little bit higher and I will do some exegesis in the Bible interpretation as well. I've, I've started to talk about how that when the Bible says his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways higher than our ways. The first thing to think is that God is so powerful and he never wants you to be aware of his thoughts and you can't question or battle with the Lord. So when he's saying his thoughts are higher than your thoughts and his ways are higher than your ways, so man, you can't know God. God is so complicated. It's not to be known really like that. But God has been demystified in Christ. There's no mystery in God when you see Christ because Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So, but when he's saying his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, therefore his ways are higher than your ways, is that also an admonition to say, for you to operate in my ways, you have to be acquainted with my perspectives or thought processes. Are you there? So for you to operate money, for you to operate life as I desire you to operate it, you must become aware of how I think. Now, Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is God's logic. I mean, they use that word. I mean, Jesus Christ is God, but the Bible calls him the logic of God or the thinking pattern. How God thinks is seen in Christ. So if you want to know how God will respond, look at Christ. If you want to know how God treats money, look at Christ. If you want to know how God treats sickness, look at Christ. If you want to know how God treats people when they are damaged or when they are um, in trouble, look at Christ. Is that clear? You can't look at Moses. To know how God thinks. Unless you interpret Moses properly. Because Moses himself. Wrote of Christ. But when there is still a veil. In your looking at Moses. You will find or see a God. That is not the true God. 1 John 5.20 I'm building this up because. You know, there are certain times with all sense of, I, I speak about how when it comes to things like money, I know why it's important to talk about this topic is because the topic is important. It's as simple as that. <laughs> money is important, so, and Jesus talked about it. We are talking about money, prosperity, success, and I, I think, I may, I've not done the research, maybe we can do a study there, but I would think that one of the major prayer points in the life of believers, especially in this part of the world, is in that area. 60% is going there. 60, 70. Then relationship to take another 30. Village people, 10, 15. Then five, praise and worship. <laughs> just I'm just kidding, but... So, but what it means is that, um, that's why some people say that once you now uproot, not uproot, or somebody jackpot, then your prayer life will be asking you questions. Okay, so what are you praying about now? In fact, even the people around you will tell you that this is not a thing of prayer, bro, right? You just need to go to a particular place. They can give you a free meal or get some level of, you know, 
food stamps, you find food, or just apply for work, you get work. People give work easily here too, right? So certain things will not be making sense again. But I, I saw a video, but there's a way deprivation and lack can tamper with our faculty. It, it does that, you know. Poverty is, it can lack, it can, and it's not just like when you are in a bad emotional state, <laughs> you would think everybody is doing you. You wouldn't think you are doing you. You would be asking whether you two are which or is that. The way. <laughs> okay. It's true. So, but so when you now go to a different environment, then your eyes are enlightened and you begin to see. And that's why, you know, it's good enough young people now start to ask questions with the kind of religion and preaching we have been preaching for a long time. Because before there was no internet. So you can tell us this thing like that, like that, but now we'll Google it and find out more what's happening there. Okay, you this one, they are not serving God. They are, no, we'll, we'll check it. They don't have money there. We'll not see they have money there. So how far? They didn't give tight. So what's going on? We have to answer those questions. You can't just say, okay, just take it. Nobody can question the Lord. No. This generation will question you. And the Lord is not afraid of questions. But because we have, you know, there are sacred cows or what I call pet doctrines. Second Timothy 3.15. For, for dead to be growth, remember, listen to this, spiritual growth is not just adding. It's subtracting. Can't you see how what was happening when you were young? You did all subjects. As you started to get older, you started to reduce it. Then when you go for PhD or you are whatever, you have a core specific thing you are researching on. So that's why the Bible says, when I was a babe, I talked, acted like a babe. When I became mature, I put childish things away. So maturity puts childish things away. So there are certain prayer points that should not become, when you hear this kind of teaching, that's where I was, I was coming from. There are certain prayer points I can't engage in. It's not that, it's not pride. <laughs> the, you have seen too much in the scriptures that it's not making sense to make those kind of prayer points anymore. And that's why we are dealing with foundation. Because when you understand some of these foundations, you will not be tempted to make certain prayer points that don't add up. Are you hearing? So what we are saying here is, Jesus, in the teaching of this subject matter from a Christocentric perspective, Christocentric perspective means the Bible is a theology. The theology of the Bible is Christology. What do I mean by the Bible is a theology? The Bible is the study of God and his character. That's why you are studying the Bible, right? Right? right. So when you study God, you must end up in Christ. Some people have studied God and they ended up in Elijah. But that's not God's intent. And it's not because the people are bad. Sometimes it's ignorant. It's a veil. You've studied God and you ended up in Moses and the over 600 laws of Moses. Now, you have not known God how he wants to be known. You know God the way you like it, but you have not known God how he... There's a way God wants you to know him. God wants you to know him in Christ. That's why the theology of the Bible is Christology. That means when I study God, the study of God is the study of the person of Jesus Christ. And all biblical topics and issues must be seen in that light. In order, remember what we started, to operate in his ways, we have to become acquainted with his thoughts. What is his thoughts? 1 John 5, 20. 
First John 5 verse 20. First John 5 verse 20. Put it up. First John 5 verse 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and had given us an understanding. That means the Son of God has come and given us a way we should view God and how he operates. The Son of God has come and had given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. That means you can know him that is false. So it's in the understanding you know who that is true and who that is false. And sometimes you have an understanding about who that is false. It influences how you pray. It influences how you view your challenges. It is influencing how you are looking at money. For example, I know you don't have it, so you are just looking. I'll tell you my own no problem. You people have been good boys and girls from beginning. Religion has no power over you. So I'll just tell you only my own. So if at my own early phases, as someone who believed in God, I believed, I believe I heard the gospel, but obviously along the line, I heard a lot of things that were not really true, that we may know him that is true. They were false. And what that false understanding of God created in me affected even my own life and how I viewed money, how I viewed prosperity, how I viewed work, how I viewed my own gifts. It has. We said here that your theology will affect humanity or anthropology, meaning how you are viewing God is affecting your society. Don't you agree? Some people have viewed God in a very bad way. They haven't killed him for him. With expectations that will not reward them. So it's a view you have about God and it's affecting the society. We've talked about the killing of twins so many times that they were killing twins with the belief that the twins were devils. It was not that they just like blood. It was a thinking pattern. So that's why the Bible says he has come and <laughs> he has come to flush certain things. That's what it means. He had, Jesus has come to give us an understanding that we may know him that is katano, that is true. Because when all those things are flushed out, we talk about maturity, what, how it does. With me too, there was a flushing that took place. You see, until it takes, you have to be loyal to the word of God. You see, if you are not loyal to the word of God to the end, what will happen is, when, it, when it's time for adjustment, that's where the problem is. And that's why there's no spiritual good. I, I need to push something here. But the Son of God has come and given us an understanding. So my understanding of God was really provoke-related. So I felt I could provoke him. Then another understanding I had about God, the way they pushed it, is like my natural gifts don't matter to God. God is not interested in all this. So... Um, like all those things are carnal things. You know, learning your strengths and certain tendencies that you have and certain passions that you have. No, those things, don't, you don't need to look at them. Just pray in tongues and that's all. But I started to realize that those strengths, recognizing them is a good idea. That's why we now, I started to teach when I'm saying these things, that even though the wisdom of God is supernaturally received, it still has to be naturally applied. And there are various instances. Because then again, I think I shared it with you, then for all of a sudden, I also thought that Gentiles' money will come to me. Who doesn't like free money? If it was there, as they said it, well, we can just try and see whether. But when you are loyal to God's word, when the word confronts those belief systems, 
you give in to it. But many times, why people don't have spiritual growth or why a lot of believers don't grow is when the word confronts them, you fight back. Now, pastor won't take this one from me. These tithes or curses, I'm not going to release it. I, I understand the love of God one. Oh, love, God loves us. But this tight one, my sacrifice. The seeds are put on the altar. You not take that one from me. That's why it says you've made the word of God of none effect through your traditions. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.15. Our popular scripture. And that from a child, you have known the Holy Scripture. But remember this one. No? He says he has come to give us an understanding so that we can know him that is true. Okay. And that from a child, thou has known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise. We are still talking of money, but from a Christocentric point. Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ. The scriptures is the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is not supposed to make us wise unto salvation. If we look at it from how the Old Testament was written, it's supposed to make us wise unto Moses. It's supposed to make us wise unto Elijah that called fire and fire came. It's supposed to make us wise unto the various laws and ceremonial washings in Leviticus. No, now, is that not what Old Testament is supposed to make us wise unto? So because you don't see the mentioning of Christ in the Old Testament except in types and shadows. So that's why the Old Testament is the concealed Christ, why the New Testament is the revelation of what was concealed in the New Test Old Testament. So the Old Testament is Christ concealed, the New Testament is Christ revealed. The Old Testament is types and shadows. The New Testament is the very image of the shadows. The Old Testament is called the mystery. So when you see mystery in the Bible, it's not something mysterious. The Old Testament is called the mystery. The New Testament is the revelation of the mystery of the Old Testament. Are you there? So when the Bible says, and that from a child, or Paul is telling Timothy, you have known the Holy Scripture, it's supposed to make you wise in salvation through a person. So the Old Testament was written to inform you about the revelation of a person. That's what the agenda of the Old Testament is. Well, let pastor show me 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2. Now, first of all, remember that the word Scripture means the Old Testament. When you see the word scripture, remember, just remember that it's not the entire Bible. The scriptures is Genesis to Malachi. Amen. Not the entire Bible. Okay? Because when the Bible says in Matthew, you do end not knowing the scriptures, not the power of God, Matthew was not yet written. So that means the word scriptures is Old Testament. And all these things are important, and I'll show you why. But... It says, by which also you are saved, if you keep memory that I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Next verse. Next verse. For I delivered unto you. Now, who is writing Corinthians here? It's Paul, an apostle. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, the Old Testament. So even this New Testament I'm preaching to you, I got it by the revelation of the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament, if you look at it properly, the Old Testament is Christ concealed. So when you have revelation, you will see Christ even in the Old Testament. Because the Bible is one book with one message. The Old Testament and the New Testament have the same message. It's just that you need to decode the Old Testament to see that the message is Christ. Are you hearing? Okay. So how that Christ died for our sins, according to the, that word scripture is Old Testament. According to the scriptures, next verse, next verse, next verse. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. Same thing, according to the scriptures. So the agenda of the scriptures 
is to show us Christ. And that's why the Bible is a Christocentric book with a Christocentric message. If you don't see that the bias of the Bible is Christ, you will have difficulty in interpreting the scriptures, in seeing God's thought concerning subject matters, and you will have an unhealthy relationship as a believer with the world and with even your life because you'll be doing things a little bit anyhow, anyhow. So that's why we're saying, second Timothy 3.15, or we are in 16 now, that, you can start from 15, that spiritual growth is not just in adding. Spiritual growth is in taking away, on learning to relearn. So, some of the things we are talking about money, you have to unlearn it. And that is where people are not ready for that unlearning because of their sacred doctrines that they have taken like a pet for years. It says, I'm from a child. You've known the Holy Scriptures is able to make the wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That word holy scriptures is set apart writings, the Hagios grammar, or the sacred writings. Now, look at the next verse, please. Look at the next verse, 16. All scripture, this is not the same thing as the sacred writings. This is called the graphe. All scripture is the graphe. means the art of writing. The documentation of the scriptures. Now, there's a way you need to listen to this. This will help you. The documentation of the scriptures or scripture or the art of writing the scripture or the art of writing is given by the inspiration of God. God inspired the writings. Does not mean that God inspired all the events that were written. This is important. Why? Because a lot of times when we are doing Bible interpretation, just who, I, know, I know people are going to say, hey, pastor, this pastor wants to throw the Bible away. No. See, calm down. Because I see that even when I talk to intellectuals, they run away at this point. Well, if you don't get this point too, you'll be struggling because you yourself will see certain things that are contradictory in the Bible. So how do you interpret it? How do you interpret that God will send an evil spirit to Saul, then Jesus will come and now be casting out evil spirit? Is he confused? So, because many times when we are dealing with certain scriptures and we are dealing with the, or we are correcting certain things in the Old Testament using the New Testament, People are saying you are altering the Bible. You are heretic. You know, how do you, they said God there. How do you say it's not God? Well, you have to understand these basics first. Are you with me? Right? What we say is that everything in the Bible is a statement of truth, but not everything in the Bible is truly stated. What do I mean? If God, God inspired them to write it does not mean God inspired the activities that were written. So, everything, let me say it rather correctly, everything in the Bible is truly stated. Let me reverse it because I think I made a mistake there. Everything in the Bible is truly stated, but not everything in the Bible is a statement of truth. Everything in the Bible, because he inspired them to document it. But it doesn't mean what was documented speaks of his own actions. So, Satan tempted Eve. That was documented. He inspired Moses to write that. But it doesn't mean that God was the one that inspired Satan to tempt Eve. Is it clear a little bit? Why it is important is because if you don't have this 
understanding. We have taught here and, and we have established how the Bible is not just logically is an ancient material that has enough proofs to show that is both a genuine and powerful book that cannot even be falsified, right? However, what we are still seeing here is that even Jesus himself was correcting certain things in the Old Testament. Because the Pharisees and Sadducees will say that our fathers ate manna from heaven in John 6. Jesus came and said it was in manna from heaven. So if you are saying why are we correcting that, then you also meet Jesus because Jesus was correcting certain things that were happening in the Old Testament. That they thought it was God, but it was not God. When things happen on the earth, there are three personalities involved. God, man, and angels. And by angels, we also speak of Satan. Right? So, in the Old Testament, because of the limited understanding they had about God, certain things that were done by men in cooperation with Satan, they put it on God. Because they had limited understanding of which the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Are you with me? Who prophesied of the grace, the New Testament that was to come. So they had limited understanding of God. And we even see it in Job. Job said, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But we now take the statements that Job make and make it the categorical nature of God. When Job said, the Lord give it, the Lord take it. Job didn't know God. But yes, God inspired that documentation, but that does not mean that that's God's character. That's what we mean. That inspired the writings does not mean he inspired the actions. Why am I doing this? Going back to 2 Timothy 3.16. Why am I doing this? Until the word of God confronts certain sacred cows and belief systems you have that are anti the word of God, you will not have true spiritual growth. For spiritual growth to occur, there must be adjustments. Are you with me? Look at what it's saying here. It says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is then profitable for doctrine. I know we are talking about money, but I'm still, yeah, I know. Permit me. That's when you come to a church that preaches the gospel. Because when you have understanding of all these things, you will not be thinking money is one complicated matter. Because you will know how God is your source and how you don't need to be disturbing him every night and day with prayer for money. But it will take time. Okay? So let's build. Let's still build. It says all scripture is given by... So that's what Paul is telling Timothy. God inspired that art of writing the scripture. Doesn't mean God inspired the actions. He now says, and that scripture is profitable, or philemos, advantageous for doctrine. Didascalia. That word doctrine, we have said, is not trouser skirt. Please. It's not skirt, earring. No, 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 no. Doctrine is teaching. Because I know how it was in my own mind as a religious person. Once I see doctrine, I'm just seeing these church rules and regulation. No. Doctrine is teaching. That's why the Bible says they continued, Acts 2.42, they continued in the apostles' doctrine or apostles' teaching. So if you even look at NLT or NIV or another version of some of the word doctrine, you see it's not what, they don't use doctrine. They use actually teaching. So, what the Bible is saying here is that all scripture is, thank you for bringing NIV, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching. Okay, go back to KJV. It's useful for teaching. So, it's not useful for just memorization. 
The scripture, I know there's nothing wrong in memorizing if you understand it. So you can regurgitate it, shout it, quote it with so much passion. Without understanding, it has no power. That's why it says everything is inspired. Their writings are inspired by God. And they are profitable for teaching or explanation. Why does the scripture have to be explained? Because he inspired the writings. He didn't inspire the actions. So if you don't explain the scripture, you'll be looking at everything together. That's what, are you getting it? And it is profitable of Philemon's advantageous for teaching. And when it is taught, you will get to the second thing, which is reproof. Now, we have explained to you, in order for you to allow the Bible to help you, or let, you want to be a Christian, a believer, you have to understand that the Bible is not an English material, like we have said. It's not a, an English book. So you can't use dictionary to explain biblical terms and phrases. So if you just use this word reproof now, what is reproof in your dictionary is not what is reproof here. And it's going to not allow this scripture or this verse or passage help you. So what that proof, reproof is, we say is evidence. It's the same word in Hebrews 11. It says, faith is the substance of things of so The evidence of things of sin. So when I explain the Bible to you, you will see the evidence. Do you get it? You arrive at the second part. When the Bible is explained properly, you will now see the evidence that, first of all, for example, that scripture is not the entire Bible. I had to show you by showing certain evidence when I said, when the Bible said Matthew, and there are more. Because in Luke 4 to when the Bible, Jesus came and took a book. The Bible says he came to the temple and took a book and spoke about as Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Do you know that scripture in Luke 4? When Jesus came into the temple and he was quoting Isaiah, he says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Isaiah 61, he has anointed me to heal the sick and all of that. The Bible says when he now sat down, he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled. So, if Isaiah is Old Testament, and Isaiah is called the scripture, that means the scriptures is the Old Testament. So, when we explain the Bible properly, you will see evidence of that explanation. There's a video that I did, it's coming out, and we're doing some videos about spiritual husband or wife. Spirits don't marry. So when you see the evidence that spirits don't marry and you still want to hold on to spirit husband, what it means is that your traditions are fighting against in spiritual warfare. Your traditions are fighting against what the word of God is preaching. And that's why the Bible says he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That's why it says receive with meekness the engrafted word of God. It takes mix, meekness to readjust those sacred belief systems you've held down because some of, some of the times they are linked to emotional experiences. I felt it. It came. But native doctors felt it. It came. You can't use it, I felt it, it came. You have to use the word of God. Are you hearing? The perfect law of liberty. Are you hearing? The Bible says, when you shall be turned to the spirit, the Lord is that spirit. And when the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He will take the veil away. 
and you readjust those belief systems, you readjust those mindsets, and you see that it doesn't matter. You can never be cursed. Whether you pay tight or you don't pay tight, whether you paid offering or you don't pay offering, we are not using that to say don't pay offering or don't give. But I can't, you are, I can't be cursed. Do you understand? Can somebody be inside Christ and be cursed? So is that evidence that you see from the explanation? But unfortunately, a lot of people don't like to sit down and hear Bible like this. It's not easy. That's when sleep will come. You think of hot white rice that you need to cook. Things will be... But if we're jumping, ah, that one won't make you think. But now, as I'm saying, oh, the second Timothy, and uh, that scale a Greek word, uh, but, but, uh, bros, bros. <laughs> but some pastor, Sam was saying it, that you go to other climbs, they'll be paying $150, $200 to sit down and hear another person speak. Do you think they don't have sense? You think they just like to waste money? <laughs> Exactly. Don't worry. <laughs> if you think knowledge is expensive, try ignorance. You will pay with more than you have ever thought. And that's why sometimes Africa is paying for it. So, allow the word of God that word receive the word of God, it takes meekness to receive the word of God. Because sometimes it's going to challenge those sacred pet doctrines you've kept for years. There are some that you allow pastor to take when he teaches. But there are some you say, no, this one. I see it sometimes when I preach, but some people are coming, are you saying, is, are you saying, is that... Like, I'm not going to allow it to go. But allow the Bible. So, let's go back. I'll show you how you need to allow. Because that's what they call spiritual growth. That's the real spiritual growth. The real spiritual growth is, I'm not going to allow, I'm going to allow the Bible to interpret itself. I'm not going to carry my own nuances and experiences and try to inject it into the scripture. You didn't write the Bible. It's not your book. So you have to submit to the writer. You can't be telling the Bible, this is what you want. You must tell me this thing. No. The Bible has to interpret itself because you are not the author. That's why we say we don't innovate scriptures. We excavate that means, when I want to look at a scripture, I look at the author, the, I try in, to go into the mind of the author to understand his audience, sit where he sat, and gain understanding of the particular environment and who he was talking to in that environment. I don't put my own influence in that teaching. That's proper Bible, come to believers class. We do that. Because in that you now realize that you have, you have, we have done bad things to the Bible. Mansion in heaven. If you, are, if you don't take care of your family, you are worse than an infidel. Some of all those things, he was not talking about man, he was just really talking about widows and how you should take care of widows there are so many 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 generational cause scripture who keep on visiting upon your fathers and many generations was wrongly interpreted so but we can't do everything in one so the same two way with money now it's the same way you have to no matter how you have seen somebody give a testimony because me too, that was one of my sacred pets, this thing. Provoke. I, mean, I liked provoke before. I like to provoke. <laughs> yeah. And you know, provoke also gives you some accolades. 
as compared to boasting in only the finished work of Christ. Because my provoke can be more than your own provoke. So therefore, you, we have to submit ourselves to the word of God and readjust. That is now spiritual growth. So spiritual growth will take away some prayers. Don't be praying it again. Do it, Lord. Come, Lord. You not do it again. You will not pray it again. It's not because now in the days of your ignorance, you may be born again. You didn't know better. But there's an information you receive. Eh? It, as you are praying that prayer, you too will be saying there's something is wrong somewhere. Because you have studied to show yourself approved. Not God, you've studied to show yourself. It's given and it's profitable. The Bible is only profitable when it's explained. The only way you will gain profit from the Bible is when they explain it. So if you don't like explaining of Bible, that's what we said. Any lazy approach to Bible study, the outcome is manipulation. Even though that wasn't the original intent. Because you will be tossed to and fro. Life itself will even want you to give Bible a new interpretation. Just your experiences of life. They want you to see God the way you want him to be seen through life experiences. So that's why you have to study. Amen. Reproof, then the other word is correction. That's the adjustment part. That's hard for even people that have had some part. Oh yes, we believe in eternal life now. We can't lose our salvation. That one, that one is okay. We take it. But Pastor, baptism to be saved, or you have to do water baptism to be born again. I don't want you to take this from me. Now, it is possible that people have not exposed themselves to that teaching and don't know better, so you have to be kind and understand. But we have shown you that baptize in the water or baptize in the spirit, they are not two different events. To be baptized in water is to be baptized in the spirit. You don't, you can't be born again two times. So once you become born again, you become born again. Now, some people practice baptism as a sign of showing that, you know, they are new and they are part of a new church and they, they are no longer, and they are showing the human beings for that purpose. They want to show the people that are gathered around. It's fine. And there are some people that I respect so much that do it. Maybe they have not understood that part. I don't do it. Because the Bible doesn't support it. John's water baptism was to point to Christ. Now, Christ has come. So that's the point. So, but that one is still even okay. But the other ones, especially with the provoking, the mantle. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That one was tough. I know some people came. I understand all your pastor is saying. But this mantle one. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. We have to go there. Because sometimes the man to one is causing problem. It's the problem that is causing that is even the most important part too. Because people are shutting their brains in expectations of mantles. And it will never come. It will never come. Okay, all the mantles, if mantle is spreading, the people that haven't given the mantle, it's only them that still remain popular and making more money. You now that have been chasing them, Don't worry. I know sometimes when I say this thing, it sounds arrogant. It's not arrogant. It's because of knowledge. Uh, when you go to a doctor's office and it's, you are telling him all the things you read in Google and he's just telling you like you don't even know what you're saying. 
a medical doctor. It will seem like he's arrogant. No, he's, he's knowledge. He has seen. He knows your symptoms. He knows what's wrong with you. He just tells you the thing, my friend. Go and stop talking what you don't know. <laughs> so it's the same way. But I believe not only me. Many people are gaining their knowledge. So you have to readjust to understand that these things have consequences. You have to, I have to push a little bit. So, for correction, that means we have to readjust our mindset. Then the word, the next one is instruction in righteousness. That word instruction in righteousness is from the word pedia, and is where they get pediatrics, is to train up a child by the way of the mouth. It's basically spiritual growth. So there's no spiritual growth until the Bible is explained, you see the evidence, you adjust, then you now have spiritual growth. Then, next verse, then next verse, let's see what the next verse is. Next verse. The man of God may be perfect. So that word perfect is, there's no sinless perfection. It's mature. You see how some simple words can confuse us. Because if you use English perfect here, which day will you be perfect? <laughs> you know now, there's no body that is perfect. So that perfect day is that you will not be mature. So maturity is a product of when the Bible is explained to you. As you keep, and it's not a one day thing. You need to keep on coming, hearing. It will help you. In this same subject matter, we are dealing with money here. When you get a Christocentric view of money, you will be a balanced human being. FOMO will not be affecting you. What's FOMO? Fear of missing out. When they are doing this prayer, you know, I used to hear that sometimes when people, there are some churches, I mean, that people go to, which is okay, I mean, right, outside of Lagos, that some will finish one program because all of them is the same road or right of way. As they have finished that one, they are inside the cab. They'll say, ah, drop me. They are doing... Still stop by. It's FOMO. It's FOMO. It's FOMO. Because you will be thinking that eventually they just keep on pushing it to another day. When you sow the greater seed. When you... Let's leave there. Leave it there. But they keep on pushing it that there's something else you need to do to gain God's approval. There's something else you have not done. That's why you are not rich. There's something else you have not done. That's why God has not come through yet. Then you are living a life of sadness, thinking that there's something you need to do all the time. One of the ones that hit me was before too. I thought to pr prosper in ministry, I must sell it all. Give it all for Jesus. Because when he called the disciples, he said, take no pause for your living. Take no pause. Just go like that. And when they came back, did you lack anything? They said, no, we didn't lack anything. So I was supposed to go all out for Jesus. If I want my ministry to be really impactful. Unfortunately for me, there was nothing to even leave. At the time I was reading that scriptures, right? What do I want to leave? Money I didn't even have to leave. <laughs> so I was even now confused with God. God, but I don't even have something to leave now. How do I apply the scripture? But I now read Acts 20 34. Put it up. Acts 20 34. Paul now, so in the New Testament. You see, let me say something. I, I said this with the believers in the believers class. No, please. Join this meeting afterwards. Because I've not got into the money part. But we have to close soon. That Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called the synoptic gospels. What do I call it? Synoptic. So when you hear the synoptic gospels, it's talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That what synoptic gospels do. It's not the old Bible. When they say synoptic gospels, you need to understand some of these theological terms. It's called, if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is like a general overview of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the account of Jesus on the earth. So that's why it's called the Synoptic Gospels, right? From Acts to Revelation, that's what we call mostly the epistles. 
what is an epistle? Epistle is like a formal letter. And in those epistles, in that, in Acts to Revelation, that's where you see Paul writing letters. So that's why it's called. See, at least we learned that one in church today, right? So that's why it's called epistles. Now, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we said that uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. Although your Bible, the people that translated it, made Matthew, Mark, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they wrote New Testament, right, in your Bible. But we said it's Old Testament. And why did we say it? Now, and why, I want to deal with why we allow the word of God confront and adjust us. And why we are careful to study certain scriptures. It's not that we want to show you that uh, we have knowledge. You. There is a reason. So we said, Hebrews 9, 17 says, for, for a testament to be of us, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. So for a testament is not in effect until men are dead, right? For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, who is the progenitor or the, of the New Testament? Jesus Christ. Was he alive in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Yes. So can Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John now be in New Testament based on this scripture? Okay, let's look at Galatians 4 from verse 3. Galatians 4, verse 3. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. We don't need to go there. He says, um, for. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the. So, Old Testament law. Right? Next verse. To redeem them that were under the Lord, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So sonship is a product of New Testament. But what am I saying here? I need to hit something so we can close. Oh, Lord, have mercy. So, because we did a lot of worship at the beginning. So, in other words, it's important to therefore know that when reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you should also understand your audience. Jesus was not speaking to believers most of the time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was speaking to people who were mentees of the Pharisees and the Pharisees themselves. Somebody is uh, trying to interpret my Turn to my interpreter or something. Anyway, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was speaking to Pharisees. That was his audience. And he was speaking to mentees of the Pharisees because the, the Bible says he came to his own, his own received him not. So he was not speaking, it wasn't a church experience in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was speaking to people who didn't even believe in him. That's why he kept on going to wild things like Matthew 5 and started to say, hey guys, you feel you are righteous, right? If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Apart if your eye, it says your good eye. Because sometimes people can't just remove the bad eye. No, if your good eye, <laughs> so you should remove the good eye. If you read it in other translation. But we don't remove our hands. We stole meat, our hands are still here. So why have we not done it? Because if you say, okay, how do you, don't, don't interpret that scripture and you are trying to make the scripture say what it's not saying. Why have you not removed your hand? That means we have to understand that scripture properly because most of all, at least, to pen or meet with our hands. So, Again, Jesus now says, before he starts to break it down like that, he now says, until your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That means if you think you are righteous, you have not gotten there yet. 
And the only way your righteousness can exceed that is to be the righteousness of God in Christ. So Jesus was still telling them that don't put your trust in self, but be found in me. I am the Messiah they prophesied about. Trust in me and you will have life and you become righteous. Are you hearing? Because I was dealing with this with a friend. He's still a good friend. Love him so much. He may not agree with this. And when I was explaining the message of grace, this is where the sacred pet doctrine, he could not leave it. Red ink. Because in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus wrote certain things, or the Bibles we have, they put red ink there. Like, other ones are okay, but this one, Jesus said it. So, because Jesus said it, we should not even look at it holistically in how the Bible interprets itself. No. Because even Paul, if Jesus, because there were things Jesus was saying in parables, but in the epistles, we don't see parables. And the epistles was written to believers. So believers were not communicated to through parables. So that means Jesus even said it to us. There are many things I want to tell you now, but you can't bear them because the Holy Spirit has not come. Are you hearing? That's why I was talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus could understand a lot of things. So why are we saying this? We are saying this to say something and close in John 5.30. I will close now. Pray for me. I'm closing. John, I know that many pastors say that thing. I know, I know. It's not only me, so. I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. This is Jesus and his red ink. Right? But it's right here. But the point is, he's making a point here. Jesus is saying, I can of my own self do nothing. I judge, and my that judgment there is not the Lord judging you. That means my claim or my, my, my own testament or te what I testify about is what to testify is what that judgment is, my claim. Right? So I can of my own self do nothing as I hear. I judge and my judgment is just. My claim about God's character is just. That's what he's saying. I'll show you. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father. That's my claim and judgment is about the Father is the right one. Which has sent me. Let's show you. Let me show you. Please, just walk with me. We'll soon close. I know it's money, but we'll see something. Next verse, please. So you see, it's the people that... Okay. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, it's, it's, it's building something here. There is another that bears witness, beareth witness of me, that I know that the witness which he witness of me is true. So, who is that? He is sent unto John. Now, the Bible says, of all the prophets born of a woman, no one has risen that is greater than John the Baptist. So, this John is John the Baptist. So, John the Baptist is the climax of the prophets in the Old Testament who reveal the coming Christ. Do we agree? So, because he's saying now that John, the entirety of John's ministry, was to show us that this is the lamp of God that will take away the sins of the world. Now, he says, Yes, I sent unto you, John, and they bear witness unto the truth about that God has decided to reveal himself in the person of Jesus and his work on the cross. That's what John's testimony is. Now, another thing that John, Jesus is saying here, you'll see it more. Next verse, next verse. But I receive not the testimony from man, but these things I say that he might be saved because they didn't believe in him in John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, next verse, next verse. He was a burning and a... That means John's testimony was powerful of the fact that God is in a person. 
Jesus. God or Jesus Christ is God revealing himself. Now, it says, burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Next verse. Next verse. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works, the works of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were speaking louder than even his words. Because he was limited in his communication in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because it was still the Old Testament. But his works revealed the heart. When he went to Peter, there is no fish he will provide. Somebody is sick, he will heal. Are you hearing? So the works of who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devils. At evening, they brought many that were sick and he, he healed them all that he might be fulfilled by the prophet Isaiah saying, himself took our infirmities, bear our sicknesses. So the works of Jesus were communicating the heart of the Father, the desire of the Father for you. So that is your baseline for thinking about prosperity. That I don't need to be shouting on God's door. God's will above all things that I may prosper and be in health and as my soul also prospered. What does it mean? It means that the young lion may lack and suffer hunger but those that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. So even though I'm in trial for a season it makes all things still beautiful in its time. I will not be threatened by a challenge or a situation because the Bible says you don't need to keep on speaking all these repetitions. The Father knows that you have need of these things. So, for me, why am I looking at this in case of prosperity? The first thing in thinking of money is that God is more willing to give you. And that's his will. And it's not based on your provoking. God wants you to have money. He doesn't just want money to have you. That's all. And his plans for you are good and not of evil. Plans to prosper you and to bring you to the expected end. So, when I think of prosperity, I'm not bothered about all the things and the checklist that I need to do for God. I know that that word father, another word for it is pata. It means source. He's my source. And more than any other thing, we don't have time to look at it, but we'll show you. The works of Jesus what Jesus was doing on the earth, he was showing you the Father's continuous disposition towards you. That's what he should be showing you anytime you read it. He never rejected any person. Even the people that needed healing. He went to Peter's mother-in-law's house. The first thing is to heal the mother-in-law. He didn't say, Peter, did you come to church last week? Go and bring the tight card. No. His will for you is consistent. They brought many that were sick. His will is health. His will is success. His will is when you are stranded, there is solution. The water or the wine had run out. Jesus is a canal people. Why did you do wedding in the first place? He changed it. And the Bible says the quality of the new wine. So he brought out quality. You are, you, God's desire for you is quality. Quality life. Quality work. Quality family. Quality health. Quality strength. Based on his love for you. As you begin to do that and know that, you become sold out to his purpose. They don't have to be threatening you to give anymore. You start to give towards his purposes. Because you know that, like I said, 
in starting a business at one point in time, I don't see how I want to be praying to God for, like I'm asking him, please bless this business. Oh, now, it doesn't add up. The business is already blessed. I only pray for direction. I pray in the Holy Ghost to be sensitive so I can receive wisdom. I can maximize relationships. I can apply myself properly. But that God, I'm trying to convince him. I wanted to say certain words, but I won't. Because what I'm confronting you with now is, first of all, this basic thing that God wants you to do well. And it's very, he gives us all things richly to enjoy. But he doesn't want you to do well by just magic. It's not magic. He strengthens you. He empowers you. He directs you. He causes you to learn through the processes. Because it's one thing to be successful. It's another thing to maintain it. So God will not take around, take all the processes and life journeys that you need to go through. We've said it, that when we are in challenging situations and we are saying, God, take me out. God is saying, no, I won't take you out. I will renew your mind while you are in that situation. By the time you are mature and you renew your mind, you will be able to take yourself out and even help others out. If you are blessed this evening, can you rise up on your feet? I know I went, we went on a journey, first of all, to just build the concept of, first of all, knowing that I'm a son and daughter of the Most High God. To be blessed cannot be that complicated. Lord, begin to say, Lord, I receive wisdom. My mind is renewed. I see myself as you have called me to be. I see myself as you see me. And I function in the purposes and plans of God for my life. I'm fruitful in all my ways. I'm productive in all my ways. I'm a believer. Redeemed and delivered. Loved by the Father. That's who I am. I'm a child of impact. Kamano Jataya. I'm a believer of impact. I'm designed to be impactful. I'm gifted. I'm tremendously gifted. I matter. I prefer solutions to my world. God is in me. So he can be with me. So he can be for me. In Jesus' precious name. If you believe that, shout glory to God. Shout glory.